Okay, so I'm Dr. McCauley, and we are in Biology 106. I need to get used to saying that. I don't get to teach 106 in the fall, so I've just been kind of thinking about Biology 105 now for the last year. I do teach 106 in the winter semester, and then again in the summer semester. Uh, typically, the last three or four years, uh, I've been the person to teach that. You should have um, pretty much most of you. There's a few of you I know who are going to be disappointed with what I'm about to say, but many of you already have all the resources you need as far as the expensive stuff. You've got your textbook, you've got your mastering code from last semester, you've got uh, atlases and all sorts of things. Uh, some of you, if you are joining me not having taken 105 since last summer, um, you're going to have to get the mastering code, and I'll get that in a moment uh, about that. But the book we're using is Visual Anatomy and Physiology, uh, second edition. Uh, this book's been out for a, a short while, maybe about a, uh, eight or nine months now. We were the, actually the first school last summer in the country to be using the textbook. And um, I think most people are enjoying the book um, versus the older book, if you will, that was very long and wordy and lots of uh, long paragraph explanations. They have basically just kind of chunked it up into small sections, made it, quote, very visual. Right? And so as I tell students, in the old days, I would tell you to read the book. Now I'm going to tell you to go look at the pretty pictures. Okay? Because as you're looking at the pictures, you'll see the little de descriptions next to it, and you will learn just as much, but in a little slightly different way than what you had in the past. Um, so let's just kind of, let me uh, get away from the PowerPoint for a second and just get to the syllabus, since you all have a copy of that. Let me run through this with you, and we'll see what questions pop up from this description. So here we are, winter 2015. It's one, uh, biology 106. L and L means it's a lecture and lab combined course, meaning you will get one grade uh, for your lab and lecture components, and I'll go over that with you in a moment. All of you have lab in the evening, yes? Uh, some of you tonight, Tuesday night, Mr. Mueller. Just so you know, uh, it won't be meeting in the room that it's supposed to be because we had a water main break above our ceiling this morning and flooded the lab. It's being repaired. You're going to be in the room just down the hallway. Listen for the noise. Mr. Mueller will be up there. I'll be up there. But you're just going to be down across the hall, OK? Uh, tomorrow night, anybody have lab with me tomorrow night? OK? And then again, Thursday night with Mr. Mueller, OK? Labs are on for the evening. We're not, we're not uh, canceling anything. We're just moving the room. We just couldn't do that during the day. And tonight, we'll be doing a histology review. So things you should have already seen and know, and it'll just be a memory lane kind of thing tonight, or this week, for lab. There's no pre-lab due. I heard some people concerning about pre-labs. There's no pre-labs uh, like you did in 105, as far as the labs go. Um, <laughs> I'll go over that when we get upstairs. And um, we are here Tuesday and Thursdays, 4.30 to 5.55. And we'll be in this room for every lecture. My office hours are kind of scattered. They're pretty much whenever I'm not in lecture or not in lab. And this semester, I have three 105 lectures. And this lecture for 106, and I've got six labs. So you know, I'm not in my office very often. Uh, those little snippets of time are pretty much when I'm walking from one activity to the other. The best way to reach me is by email, sean.macaulay. Uh, my phone number on there actually is that of my secretaries, because I have not checked my voicemail now in about six and a half years. It just keeps blinking. I have no idea how to answer it. I have no idea how to get the old messages off. It's full. So just don't call me, because I don't, unless I'm in the office, I don't, I don't uh, really get those messages. So call my secretary if there's a real emergency. Otherwise, email me, and I'll be pretty quick to respond to you. Uh, this is the second semester of a sequence. Uh, this course with 105 transfer very nicely and well-respected around the area to MSU or Ferris or GVSU, and they satisfy the AMP requirements for most institutions. Um, in the second half of this course, our goals are a little bit different. As you know, if you took 105 here, um, our 105 course is largely, not exclusively, but largely anatomy. That is, we're looking at a lot of, you know, name that, name that, what's that part, what do we call this? And we throw in a little bit of physiology to make it interesting and try to connect the pieces together. How does this all go together? In this course, 106, we're going to be Assuming you remember most, if not all, of your 105 information, we're going to build on that information. We're going to be asking the questions, now that we know the pieces and the parts, how does it work? How do we put it together? More of a physiology course. The labs are definitely more physiology. And in the lab, we will be adding a little bit more anatomy. We'll have a few more bone markings. We're going to learn some deeper muscles in the lab. You know, in 105, we did the superficial muscles, the ones you can touch on the outside of the model. In 106, we'll be taking the models apart and going deeper into the muscles. We'll be looking at some... Um, 
uh, urine analysis labs, some respiratory functioning labs, some EKGs. So it's definitely uh, more of a physiology laboratory. Um, required materials. Okay, let's get into that. So most of you are set. You have your textbook. Uh, with your textbook, if you buy the bundle upstairs, there's a book called The Worksheets. Okay, and last semester, if you took 105, you know, we turned in some of those pages for lab credit. And this semester, I will also be pointing you to some of the pages in that. That book's been out now for a semester or two, and it is possible to buy that book a la carte, okay, um, through Amazon for probably 10 bucks or so. So that might be a way to get that worksheet book. The bigger concern, though, for the students who were not recently in 105 is the mastering. Mastering AMP is an online resource that is connected to the textbook, and we will be taking quizzes and doing some online activities through that program. So it is not a nicety, it is a necessity uh, for the course. If you've already got it from last summer or last fall, you're set. I'll help you get registered if you're having trouble. The newer students can buy that mastering code a la carte. Okay, and you can do that in the bookstore. They have them upstairs. Or when you go to register online on Blackboard, when you go to register, it will give you the option, I believe, to buy it right there with your credit card. Okay, so you have some options. Um, usually it's a bit cheaper to buy it with your cash than it is to buy it through the bookstore. But if you're using financial aid, you'll want to get it through the, through the bookstore. Okay, so that's, that's sort of my little caveat on that. With that mastering code comes an e-text of this textbook. Okay, now if you're comfortable using an e-text on your tablet or computer, then in essence, uh, you might be okay. Here you go, Mr. Silas. You might be okay. Um, if you're the kind of person who needs to have a physical book, I saw even a used book upstairs in the bookstore. And this book has been out for a while now, so you may be able to pick up a copy uh, cheaper. But you want to have the, the textbook, I'll say optional, if you will. Uh, I'm really speaking to the students who are just kind of like, I've only got one more semester to get through this, and I don't want to buy a whole other $250 package, and I get that. Um, but you definitely want to have the mastering AMP code. So talk to me if you're having concerns about resources. The course ID is here in bold on the syllabus, Macaulay 64, what is that, uh, 926. And you shouldn't even need that code. It's already linked to Blackboard. But if it pops up and says, what is your instructor's course ID, that's it. When you go in there, you're probably going to have, who has already registered for mastering this semester using last semester's materials? So tell me what it looks like for you, because I can't replicate what you saw. You went into Blackboard? Yeah. Clicked on Mastering AMP, and it prompted you to what? To, when I clicked on it, it said hello, it's my name. Hello. I was there. Oh. Yeah. So it's, it's smarter than I thought. OK. Uh -huh. Too smart, perhaps. So it already knew who you were. Yeah. And you just had to log in with your username and password that you had used previously. So very simple. I didn't even have to do that. Yeah, I didn't even have to log in. OK. Beautiful. OK, that's nice to know. <coughs> Anybody else with a concern? Valid. Valid, and she had me go a different way. Okay. I still have it because I didn't have the course code. Anymore. Right. If you get a snag, they do have a 24-7 support number. They're pretty receptive. They mostly speak English. You'll get some help, okay? And you just need to be kind of, they're not trying to diagnose your problem and say, you know what, I just need to get my code. I need to get registered, and, and they'll help you through that, okay? So call them. I know it's a little inconvenience, but when the technology stuff doesn't work, I don't have the means to fix it for you. So please, there's a number up there, tech support, who are you, and, and you'll get uh, pretty fast service. Okay, uh, course objectives, the, the orange covered, right? That's your uh, le uh, lecture supplement. You'll want to have that when you come to lecture. The lab supplement, plenty of those upstairs, those have a red cover, okay? And that's a much smaller document, and that is what you'll need for lab. Okay, starting tonight. And then um, you're going to need some Scantron forms. These are a little bit different than what most instructors use on campus. It's the same ones I've used before if you've had me. These are 884-E forms. That means nothing, but the bookstore knows what that means. These are a full 8.5 by 11 green double-sided Scantron form. Don't let them sell you an orange form. Don't let them sell you a half strip of paper green form. Those are not the ones I'm using. 
they don't have these in the vending machine. They don't have these necessarily out on display. Ask when you check out of the book. Uh, you want good access to a computer, and uh, that's that's you know something for all of your classes. And so uh, be asking yourself if your computer crashes. Uh, who would you go bug? Where would you go if your Wi-Fi goes down or your internet goes down? Uh, just have that backup plan. There will be a number of deadlines, and I'll show you this on mastering in a moment. And you don't want you just want to plan on uh, things going wrong. Uh, this seems to be the way things are for me lately. So just plan ahead and meet those deadlines. And so you want to have a really good computer access. Um, on the next page, how are you going to get your grade? I always design my courses. I'm a really simple person. I always design my courses with a thousand points. I just think it's easier. You know, some people have, you know, every exam's worth 63 points or something, and it just gets crazy for me. So I just like having even numbers. So 1,000 points total, 70% of your grade, 700 points will come from lecture, things we do online in lecture and the exams in the lecture. 300 points will come from the lab, okay? And we'll get out into that lab stuff when we get there this week. So the, um, there will be five exams, okay? I just said get six. I just said six. Get six forms, didn't I? Yeah. I think you only need five. Well, yeah. Is there six exams? Mm -hmm. Only five. Only five Scantron forms. I miscount. Okay. Only five forms. So there are five exams total. There is no cumulative final exam. It's simply another exam at the end. So there'll be five exams, each worth 100 points. There will be some lecture quizzes. Those quizzes are going to be on mastering. And uh, they'll be sequential. So about every chapter or so that we're going through, there will be a quiz. Sometimes there'll be two or three quizzes assigned to or associated with each of the exams. Um, in the past, I had about mm, 14 or 13 quizzes. Only 10 of those will count. So I don't have that on the syllabus, but usually there'll be a few extra quizzes, which means that I'll drop a few, okay? I don't know how many exactly, but if you miss a quiz, you're sick, you just did really poorly on a quiz, know that a couple of times the lowest quiz grades will get dropped. Ten of them will count, okay? I think last semester I had 13 quizzes, okay? So you may get to drop two or three quizzes. Uh, exams, you don't get to drop the lowest exam. Okay, but the quizzes I have a little bit more grace on. There will be two case studies, each worth 25 points. Those are going to be group activities. And uh, typically, typically your lab partners make great case study partners. Okay, I'm not going to require that, but it just makes more sense. The people you're going to see once a week and spend three hours with on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday evening, or Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday evening, you might as well do this activity with them. We'll get to that later on, but these case studies aren't a whole lot of work, um, but you're going to get 25 points for each of them. Then the mastering assignments, uh, throughout the semester there will be these homework-like assignments, and... I will give you a total of 50 points at the end of the semester if you have done at least 80% of the possible points. So each of those assignments on mastering will be worth some variable number of points. And as long as at the end of the semester, when I tally up all the points that you've earned, as long as you're at 80% or better, then you'll get all 50 points. That's 5% of your overall grade. Basically, I'm giving you 5% to do your homework. Okay. Uh, there's really no reason not to get at least 80%, I think, because it is open book, it's open resource, and the more quality time you spend doing the mastering assignments, the more critically you will have been thinking through the content and the better you'll do on the exams. And so I know there, there's, a, there's a small fraction of you, maybe larger than you're willing to admit, oh, mastering is just a bunch of busy work. Well, you got to learn it somehow, and this is just another way to learn it. And so embrace it, love it, enjoy it, look at it as just another way of learning. And in the old days, I would have said, eh, just read this and know it. Now I'm giving you some fun things to do to learn it. So budget your time, look at those mastering assignments, do as well as you can on them. If you miss a couple of them, it's okay. Just make sure you do the rest of them. So if you get sick or miss a couple deadlines, it's okay. By the end of the semester, make sure you've got 80% or more of the total points. And then lab, that's the 300 points that you'll discuss this week with your lab instructor, Mr. Mueller or myself on Wednesday night. The dates for the exams are already set for you. Uh, we'll look at the calendar in a moment. The numbers are the same as they were last semester. You need at least a C in this course 
for it to transfer to another institution. You need at least a C in this course for nursing or respiratory therapy to recognize that you met the material well enough. And so that's that magic number of 720 points. And I always, I don't always say this, but it says over on the side, no, final grades are not rounded up. What you'll see, what I do is that, well, let me ask you this. What grade is 719 points? Yeah. And a tearful email. Okay. And, and I get a few of those tearful emails every year. I'm so close. But in reality, and you'll hear me clearly on this, and you'll hear me say it throughout the semester, after every exam, if any kind of adjustment or, quote, curve is necessary, I will curve a little bit along the way. Okay. So I'm not going to curve again at the end what I've already curved. So you might think you're really close, but you, you missed it along with everyone else's curve, if you will. So at the end, 719.9 is, in my book, still a C minus. If you smile at me, maybe it's a, it's a C. But I'm not going to give much room at the end. Okay, So just keep that in mind on the numbers. That also means don't blow off these mastering assignments. I get really, I get sad. I kind of beat my steering wheel on the way home once in a while when a student has done really quite well in the course. All semester, they've done really quite well. And then I look at their mastering assignments, and they've only done half of them. And now I'm taking away 2 or 3% from a student who really had done quite well. And I just hate to see that happen. It happens, not to too many students. But please, just keep up with those mastering assignments, and I'll keep reminding you about them. A uh, few more things. Any questions on resources other than people needing to get the lecture supplement in their hands? Yes, sir. At this point, yeah, last semester, uh, the, the, the mastering assignments right now are limited to one time. And uh, what I did last semester is I actually just uh, posted the assignment two times, and then you could choose to do it, you know, two times. I probably only had, out of 150 students, no, I only had uh, about 100 students last semester, I probably only had three people who actually did them twice. <laughs> but for those who wanted to, they could. So if you want to do them a second time, let me know, and I can just repost the assignment. And then I'll, I'll go in and choose which one you did better on and count that in your total points. But typically, they're, just to, they're meant to do once, OK? Uh, I'll show you that in a moment. There are plenty of other things that you'll be doing and plenty of other practice for you. Okay, So let me, give me a moment, and I'll show you that. Uh, let me just keep going down under laboratory notes. Again, you're going to go over this tonight or this week. Uh, you probably know that while attendance in lecture, I'm not taking attendance. I'm not giving you points for being here. I'm not that nice a guy. Um, but you are expected to be in lab, okay? And lab is absolutely necessary, and we'll go over those uh, rules with you uh, this week. And I think I've got a lot of that stuff on here about lab, just to be complete. Um, cell phones during lecture, man, unless there's a really big emergency, maybe I'm just really, really old-fashioned, but cell phones drive me nuts. Um, they drive me nuts in a movie, right? When the person four rows down is texting somebody and you're reading it over the shoulder and you know, it just drives me nuts. It's distracting. So please, unless it's truly an emergency, please do not be texting during class. If, you're, if you have a laptop or a tablet and you're following along online or doing something like that and it's legit, that's fine. But please, I don't want to put a complete uh, uh, ban on technology, but please make sure that it's class-related. And uh, da, 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 da. that's about it for that page, I think. We'll go over the lab stuff. Uh, exams, just a note up here on page three. Uh, exams will be during our normal class period. They'll be an hour and 25 minutes. That's how long our lectures last. The days that we have exams, that's all we're going to be doing that day. Um, makeup exams, I really try to minimize them. And so my policy is that if you have to take a makeup exam, it's at the end of the semester. Now, if there's extenuating circumstances, I've already received a couple of emails, people who know they're going to be gone for certain very good reasons, I'll work with you. But typically, um, all makeup exams will be at the end of the semester. Uh, we do have some really good resources for you here at the college. If you're not aware of the biology resource room, that's in room 249. It's a little uh, kind of a modified uh, closet, if you will. But it's off from, uh, right across the hall from the labs. I'm really excited. In the new building, you may have seen all the construction outside. We're getting a new building. That building is completely for biology and life sciences. We're going to have six brand new state-of-the-art labs, and we're going to have a beautiful uh, biology resource room in there, just a massive space for this. But for now, we have this little room called 249. 
in there you're going to find computers and models and books and a place for you to spread out. Not a lot, but you can meet there with other people. That's also where our walk-in tutors are going to be. And we have a, a couple of individuals who are currently or have already taken this course who will be there to help you. And I'll post those hours for you very, very soon, as soon as that's uh, finalized. But that's a great place to hang out and to work with other people, maybe before, not before lab. Most of you are here before lab, but um, find a time to, to hang out there. There's also one-on-one um, -on -one tutoring available for you if you think you would be uh, have an advantage of getting a tutor. Please uh, contact the tutoring center, extension 394, or stop by in room 204. Talk with them. There's a couple of tutors who are on, ready to go, to help you out. So if you think you would want to do that, I suggest that you sign up sooner than later. The rest of it, one well, after the rest of it, but the next section of the syllabus is truly the verbiage that you'll find on every syllabus on campus. I get an email from the college saying, you know what, you need to make sure you have X, Y, and Z in your syllabus. And so what it basically says is that we're accredited, uh, that uh, we're well respected by our learning community. I have taught this course in ones like it at about six different schools within West Michigan and around the country. And I can assure you with great confidence that what we're doing here is on par or in some ways better than other schools in our area. So just know you're in good hands. You've got a lot of material to learn, but you're going to be uh, expected to learn just the right amount of stuff to be successful in the future. Just so I know, how many folks here are nursing, pre-nursing or nursing program? Okay. How many are respiratory therapy? A few. How many of you are pre-med? Anybody? Pre-med, pre-physical therapy? Occupational therapy, PA, dental hygiene, radiography, imaging. Who am I missing? Veterinary? Biomed. Biomed, okay. Most of the fields we're talking about are things that are going to involve anatomy and physiology pretty heavily, right? And so uh, this is good stuff. Uh, it also tells you to check your email. Every announcement that I send out to you through Blackboard will also go to your email. So you can be either checking the Blackboard announcements or email. It'll be the same communication from both places. Uh, then it talks about behavior. You respect me, I'll respect you. Pretty basic stuff. Integrity. We're in a pretty big room. Uh, wandering eyes happen sometimes. I'm going to ask that you please, 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 uh, please don't cheat. I mean, silly for me to say that. You're all adults. Hopefully your work is your work. Um, every semester, I have someone who uh, tries to get away with something. Uh, maybe some people get away with it, but I really expect you to, this is your own work. And uh, your coworkers and your, your colleagues and your students here all expect also that you're doing your own work. So please don't be guilty of any sort of academic integrity issues. Please, please, please. Um, dispute resolution. If you have a concern about the course or the way you're being treated or anything that's going on procedurally, there is a process in place for you. And that's all laid out for you there in the fine print. OK. And then it tells you to check your blackboard, da 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 <clears throat> Notes about lecture. Um, be here. I think it's important that you come. If you're not coming to lecture for some reason, make sure that you're checking out the YouTube link that I'll show you in a moment, that you can watch the, the video, watch the lecture from home or wherever you are as quickly as possible. There is a quite a bit of material. I'm going to depend upon you to dig into the book, maybe a little bit more than what we did in 105. And I do expect that you will you know, embrace the book and be using the book quite a bit. There is quite a bit of material. Sometimes I'm going to say, especially, I have a mixed crowd here. Some of you took 105 with me. And because you took 105 with me, I know exactly what I think you should know. Right? You may not remember it all, but I know what story you've heard before. Some of you are coming in from previous semesters, previous instructors. They may have emphasized slightly different things in their course. You'll have to inform me. If I get to something and I'm saying, you know what, you should already know that, and you're like, no, really, we never saw that, let me know that. with respect, right? And I'll quickly go back and tell you that whole story to fill in any gaps that you have. Uh, but that's important, okay? So please just communicate with me. If I start assuming something and you know that you and others have never seen or been, uh, have seen that content, please let me know and I'll help fill in the gaps, okay? But there are going to be, as you look through your supplement, if you've already looked through it, each chapter starts off with a little phrase on the box that says, you're responsible for going back and reviewing certain sections of your textbook things that I am, quote, assuming, I know I taught in 105, that I'm assuming you know or need to go back and review, okay? So there's going to be some stuff that um, 
it's like, this is like calculus two, right? Um, I'm not gonna be testing you directly on what was in calculus one, but a lot of stuff carries over, okay? And so there will be some funda fo uh, foundational, fundamental information that is gonna pull over into your learning. Uh, exams, uh, my exams will be largely multiple choice. There may be a few short answer, fill in the blank type things. For those who had me before, there's no vocabulary. Okay, I don't do vocabulary in 106. Uh, you should have already been exposed to that. That's another thing. Uh, those who didn't have me for 105 didn't have my little 500 prefix suffix thing. And some of you are saying, yay, I didn't have to go through that. But as I go through my terms, I'm going to be saying, you should know what this word means because you've had that before. Okay? If you feel like you want to see that list of terms, I will certainly post that. And then you can go back and refer to some of the prefixes and suffixes that my 105 students have seen. Uh, you know, I think that's about it. Attendance policy, there really isn't one for lecture. Lab, it's required. Students with disabilities, bottom of page five. If you are an individual with a documented disability, in the past you have received special services or something like that, please know I will work with the student services office and you need to go reestablish that connection with them in room 101. So if you've had any concern in the past, please go talk with them. They will let me know in confidence that you need some sort of accommodation and uh, we'll work together with that. Uh, finally, at the very back page, page six here, if you would, just turn to two or three other folks that you don't know, uh, gather their information. This will be a person that you can contact if you have a question. Maybe this person will also be in lab. In lab, you'll get to do the same thing again tonight. But go ahead and just uh, turn and introduce yourself to a couple folks and get some information. How are you doing? Hey, Tony. I'm Ryan. Nice to meet you, man. We've got the super guys in the front. Everything? Hey, well, I'll, I'll scratch it. Open the hand. This is a busy break. I came in here with Barrett Baker, so this is. Yeah, Barrett is like 40. I taught Barrett, so my first year of Michigan. And there's like 40 higher level ones. Who's teacher? Dr. David Dubarrett. I'm trying to think there's a. There's like there's a three piece position for the pharmacy, right? And there's, uh, there's, there's like two or three different layers. There's like one of nine course, like one semester survey. Um, so I taught a couple of those courses in the chapter, one of the major courses in the other So a little bit of a little So your first course was like AP1? Uh, AP21. And what you said, yeah, you did. Muscles, nerves, and bones, and that's not it. Muscles, nerves, bones, uh, all of it. Well, do you do all systems? Yeah, well, you just kind of... Because there's different ways of setting up, dividing up A and P. Well, it and, seems uh, like you kind of get, like, introduced to, like, general things. Of everything? Everything just kind of starts shrinking down to, like, smaller things. Got it, got it. You'll be fine. We'll okay. figure it out. We'll figure out where your holes are, and we'll fill them in. I didn't realize that happened. I just know that that was a big mess. Um, well, the one on 94, yeah, too. One on, yeah, it was that was yeah, crazy. The one on uh, 31 here. Okay, yeah, okay. The was the one I got you got the middle of it all and got sandwiched? Well, we were going to the hospital with a different call. We had a patient loaded, and I knew we were coming up on the accident, so I slowed down, put the overheads on, parked in the middle of the highway to block everything else because I couldn't get through because all the cars. And then I see about 40 miles an hour. You're part, of the, you're part of it? Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you're okay. Yeah, it was the second accident. <laughs> I just realized I forgot to push pause, so you get to hear all that noise on here. I apologize. Um, <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the calendar. You can just keep filling in your name. Uh, let's just take a look at the calendar, and let me explain something about this. Now, in Biology 106, yes, I'm assuming that you're bringing in the information from 105. Uh, we're going to start at the back of the book. We're going to start on page chapter 25, and we're going to talk about water balance and ion concentration, sodium and potassium, and where all that's found in your body. And then we're going to quickly shift. We'll get through that conversation, I hope, today. And then we're going to start moving into the nervous system. You know, last semester, and that's on uh, Thursday, January 15th, this is axonal transport and physiology of neurons. 
you know, last semester when we talked about neurons in the nervous system, I just said, you know what, an action potential, an electrical signal is sent down the axon, and we never really talked about what that really means. So we're going to dive into the nitty-gritty of that whole process, and to understand that, we need to start with sodium and potassium today. So there's, there's a reason for the madness of the way that we're running around the book here. And we'll spend, um, as you can see, about three or four lectures talking about axons and neurons, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about functional regions of the brain, some parts of the brain you haven't necessarily learned in lab before. We're going to dive in a little bit deeper. We're going to talk a little bit more about hearing and vision and taste. Again, not so much about the structures of the ear, but how does it work? How does the eye work, right? Rods and cones and that kind of thing. And then we'll, uh, that'll be our first exam. So if we look down, Tuesday, February 3rd, right, in bold, That'll be our first exam. It'll cover the content from what we discussed in chapters 25, that's the water balance, to 11, 13, and 15. And that'll bring us through pretty much the nervous system. Then we'll continue on with the autonomic nervous system. That's really more of a review of things, just kind of a review of that. We'll move into hormones. Um, last semester, I, I talked about hormones a little bit. Uh, we, int we introduced just a couple of little moments, and we'll dive in deeper with hormones, how they work, uh, and understanding different hormones. Then we'll move into some bone development. And your second exam on the 17th of February will include autonomic nervous system, endocrine hormones, and a little bit about the bone development. And then we'll move into uh, muscles. And you already know a lot about muscle, but we're going to dive in deeper again. What's involved with... Uh, uh, the actin and myosin, when they're sliding over each other and muscle contractions are happening, we'll dive into that a little bit deeper, quite a bit deeper. We'll also then move on after we get out of skeletal muscle, we'll move into cardiac muscle, and that'll be a natural segue into the heart, and we'll move into things about EKGs and blood pressure and vessels. Uh, then after we get through with the blood and the heart story, we'll have an exam on that. We'll move into a little bit about the lymphatic, the immune system, and the digestive system, and respiratory systems, and then we'll finish up the semester with urinary and reproductive physiology. Okay. Um, we've got a fair amount to cover okay, this semester, and the, 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 the schedule's here. The numbers over on the right-hand side are the modules. If you open up your martini book, you'll see that every two-page spread is called a module, okay? So it's module 25.1, 25.2, and uh, that's what those numbers are referring to over on the side. Some of those modules are things that you should have already looked at last semester. And when I start talking, I'll go over briefly a quick review, and then we'll move forward. But you'll know where to go. You'll know where to go back to. In fact, your course pack, I, I made the pictures bigger, if you'll notice, they're as big as I can make them uh, in uh, the program. So I've tried to make the images a little bit bigger in your course pack. And some of those slides we won't be talking about. They really were there as a review for you. You know, if you don't remember some of this, here are some slides to go back and remind yourself about some things. All of these slides will be available for you on Blackboard if you want to look at them in a larger size. And I may be supplementing some things along the way. Uh, because we did switch over to a new textbook last summer, uh, this is the first time I will be teaching 106 with this new book, okay? I've taught it with older books, and I've tried to make an effort this semester to kind of switch over. And so for that reason, um, there may be some extra notes in here in front of you that I'll be uh, either skipping over, and I may be supplementing them a little bit along the way. This isn't my, you know, uh, final product, if you will. It's kind of a work in progress, okay? So that's what you have in front of you. Any questions about the schedule? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you know what week the first lab practical falls on? You know, there, in the lab, there are three lab practicals. I don't have that schedule in front of me. Um, I have it. You have it, the lab yeah. schedule? Okay. First lab exam, February 16th. Yep. And uh, I think on one of the days, it looks like it's scheduled that looks for weird. like a Monday or a Wednesday. Yeah, the date here is the week of. Oh, okay, okay. So the week of the 16th, and then the week of the 30th of March, and then one at the end in April. Okay? So it looks like we'll have a, a, a fun week there. we got a lab exam and a lecture exam. It looks like they've kind of fallen together. Uh, just so you know, not to point <coughs> fingers or anything, in 105, 
Um, I'm the lab person, I'm the person responsible for 105 lab. And for 106, Mr. Matoni is responsible for 106 lab. And so I kind of take direction from him for 106 labs, and he takes direction from me for 105 labs. And so uh, um, that's the schedule, and I'll be looking at it with folks tonight as well. Any other questions about the scheduling? Syllabus, anything at all? Okay, let me show you online. Um, all of you are seasoned students, most of you, um, as far as being around Muskegon. But let's just go really quick to the Blackboard site and let me introduce you to what we've got here. So, of course, when you go into uh, Muskegon, go down to our course, Biology 106. Once in here, you're going to find some tabs on the side, uh, all the announcements that are showing up, and then there is a folder for lecture materials, okay? There's a folder for the YouTube lecture links that I'll show you. There's a folder for laboratory materials. Mr. Matoni will be keeping this updated for everything we need throughout the semester. And then there's a link to Mastering A and P. Um, so under lecture, pretty straightforward, there's the syllabus. Uh, there's the lab syllabus also posted there. Uh, here are the materials for exam one, and this is a work in progress. So right now you can find this particular lecture that I'm about to give you right now, just chapter 25, is posted there for you. And then I'll post the next one as we move along. Most of you have this supplement, or you're going to be getting it in the next day or so. This is just kind of a backup for you. If you wanted to pull up the images, have them a little bit larger, look at them in color, that sort of thing. It's just all there for backup for you. Then we have um, under YouTube lecture links. Now, this could be interesting for you. Um, I don't necessarily suggest it. I left them available for you last summer when I was teaching Biology 106. I was using a different textbook, a totally different note pack. And so when you go back and listen to these lectures, they'll be, you know, I'll be talking about things that you're not looking at. So I don't know that I would spend a whole lot of time looking back at old lectures. I will be posting this lecture and everyone after this under here. So when you click on this, it'll say lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, lecture four, and it'll be a little link. You can take that link, drop it into your browser, and you'll go to YouTube, and now you'll see and hear everything that I'm marking and talking through. It has been, for some students, very successful uh, to go back and review the lectures. There's always uh, someone who says, well, what's one more thing I can do to be more successful? And I think having listened to students for the last little while, probably the number one thing that has been working for students is rather than spending another hour reading through your notes one more time, click on YouTube and listen to the lecture one more time. And that seems to be as helpful as anything else that students have told me has worked for them. And then uh, under laboratory materials, again, when you click on this, you'll see the things that we have for the first lab for you. And then on Mastering a &P, when you click on this, I guess it knows who you are now, and it'll just bring you right in there. Uh, but if you need to register for it, it should just bring you to or bring you to a link that it brings you to the mastering site. The mastering site looks a little bit like this when you log on. It says in the top corner, Biology 106, Winter 15. That's my little code up there for this. And you're going to see a calendar. Now, last semester, those who had me and were using mastering, um, there were always concerns with students saying, I didn't know we had an assignment, or I didn't know when the deadline was, or, 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 okay? So I need you to be looking at this calendar. So when it pops up, there is an assignment due this Friday. Now, it's the same one you might have done last semester. It's the introduction to mastering AMP. It's going to force you to get onto here. It's more of a tutorial put together by Pearson that navigates you through the tools and the way to use mastering. So just click on that. That'll be worth three points for doing that. And then uh, you'll see other, these group assignments. Uh, this one's chapter 25, okay? So this one is due by Sunday. And then there's a couple of them due about the nervous system, chapter 11, on the 21st. And then you'll start seeing some homework assignments as well. And um, I move a couple of these things around, but you can see there's quite a few things on mastering. Each one is not that overwhelmingly long, but these are the deadlines. 
You should be able to access them a few days in advance of these and spread your work out. And these are the assignments that you're going to be getting points for toward that 50 points at the end of the semester. Um, there will also be, they're not on here yet, some quizzes. And I'll definitely announce when those quizzes will be. And um, I would always suggest that you do the homework assignment before the quiz. That makes sense, right? Listen to the lecture, do as much studying as you can. The quiz will be open book. The homework is open book. And um, just do, but I, was always do, I would always do the homework before I would attempt a quiz. So take a look at this. Um, the other thing I want to show you is come on down here to e-text. There's your link to the e-text. Study area. So once you're in mastering, study area is a very, very rich environment. Lots of things, some of which I'll be pointing you to as we need to. It's set up chapter by chapter at the very, very top. The very, very top, you can just see there's a, a chapter up here. Uh, let's just go to chapter 25. That's what we're doing today. And under chapter 25, we're only doing sort of the first, oop, that's not it. We're only doing like the first half of it. Sorry, I clicked on something wrong here. There we go. So under chapter 25, look at this. There is a, st a chapter guide. There is a pretest. There are quizzes. There are activities. And there's a practice test. That's just for chapter 25. I'm not assigning those things particularly, right? But those are great resources. So when you're like, I want to practice some more. I want to see some more content. That's where you can go, OK, and, and click on those. Now, my recommendation to you is take a look at these pretest things or look at the, the chapter quizzes and do them. Uh, find a couple things on here that you have time for. Do those activities. Do those activities for the next couple of weeks in preparation for the first exam. After the first exam, ask yourself, if I did well, keep on doing what you've been doing. Find those same routine and keep going. If you get to the first exam and you say, you know what, I wasn't as prepared as I thought I would be. I better change up my routine a little bit. Talk to me. We'll figure out what other activities on here you could be playing with and interacting with uh, to be successful. So just know that there's lots and lots of things on here. There is also other tutorials, some movies, some uh, dissection <coughs> videos, some other lab-related things, even a program called Physio uh, X. It's a laboratory simulator. And we'll be interacting with some of those content areas throughout the semester. So mastering is a very, very important part of your, of your uh, library and the uh, ways to be successful. OK. I think that's about it as far as online things. My uh, plea to you is please get onto Blackboard, click around a little bit, take a look at the <coughs> lab and lecture folders, make sure you're comfortable with all that. You know what's there. Take a look at mastering. If, for some reason, um, you do not have the funds, financial aid's not in or something, and you need to purchase a, a mastering code, and you don't have the money right now, when you go in to register, there is a, either a 10-day or two-week free trial. So hopefully, there's no reason why you can't just go ahead and get enrolled, right? Use the free trial for a couple of weeks, and then hopefully two weeks from now, you have the money to go buy that, and then it'll just pick up your account right from where you left off. So please uh, don't let finances be the reason not to get started and have a great successful start to the course. Go ahead and do that free trial. Fair enough. Any questions about mastering? Yes, sir. OK, so we have the mastering A&P assignments yes. that we do every week. Yep. And then we have lecture quizzes, too. And they'll all be on mastering. And it's just all on mastering. It's all going to be scheduled right here. OK? So you'll get accustomed to looking at it, and, um, and I'll make announcements and reminders about what's coming up. OK? Question? I'll, I'll get to everybody. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to use that code because you're going to go through Blackboard. Don't go to the website that I mentioned, okay? That's my bad. Go instead to Blackboard, click on Mastering AMP, and it should now link you in. It already knows what course it is because it's already linked to Blackboard. It's that smart. So don't go to MasteringAMP.com and do it that way. Instead, that was my bad for mentioning that in the syllabus. Just go into Mastering on Blackboard and go that way. OK, let me know if that works. Question? I had to buy it, and the AP to option to buy it for like $60 or $70, and another option for 100 and something a third year 
the different, I'm imagining the differences with or without the e-text, okay? Your choice. Um, just so you know, I know this is a really expensive pack, okay? I, I say this every semester. I also know these are good resources, and I know that most of, us, most of you are going into medical science fields. And this book is an investment not only in your education, but into your personal library. This is likely a book you would hold on to, a book that you would keep on your shelf, a book you will use throughout your RT or nursing career as you're in school. It's a book you'll come back and look at. I can't say that about every book that I've ever had, right? I can't say that about every book that my kids are taking in college. But there are some fundamental books that you're going to keep on your shelf, and this is one of them. So just know you're making an investment in your own personal library and in your own personal learning, something you're going to re refer back to. Uh, but it is an expensive start. I apologize for that. Yes. I got the first edition. First book edition. For ten dollars in Amazon. And I don't know how many changes there are, but that's yeah. certainly a, a reasonable place, you know. And even the second edition, I saw a used book upstairs. I don't know how much it was, mm -hmm. but this has been around now. There's probably at least one semester of cycling, so there's going to be some used market values now, even on the second edition. Thank you, though. Okay. Any other concerns about resources, mastering? Yes, ma'am. They're just different types. Right, right. But are those kind of towards the... Yes, the yes. Uh, this semester, I'm going to try these. Now, last semester, I had started these assignments, and some people didn't like them. I've gone through and chosen these specifically. And if you've had me before, you know that I will listen to your feedback and your concerns, your criticisms, and all that good stuff. I'm going to start off here. And if we find that any one of these types of assignments is just not helping us, as most of you, I'll drop it. But at this point, everything on there is going to be a thumbs up for now. Okay, but then I want to hear from you if you find that something I'm assigning is not that meaningful for you. Okay. In 105 or 106, because we expect you to know a lot of the old material, I think by going through some of these, you'll, you'll be reminded of some old content as well. Any other concerns? I have a question. Yes. About the Amerman book. Um, are we going to need that? Yeah, the Amerman book is the uh, lab manual used for 105. If you have it, you're going to want to hold on to it someplace. We're not going to be assigning. If Mr. Matoni assigns one or two pages from it, we'll make sure those pages are available for you. It's just a great resource to have, something you would not bring to class or bring to lab, but something you might want to have just at home to refer back to once in a while. But the big old Amerman lab manual, nothing you need to bring or have this semester. Um, and like I said, many of you didn't have that book or are coming from someplace else. We'll make sure those copies are available to you if you've lost it or don't have it. Um, what are our pre-labs going to look like? There are no pre-labs. There are very, very few pre-labs for Biology 106. In 106, let me just kind of explain the philosophy, at least the way I look at it. 105, a lot of you are kind of getting started. There's a lot of really green students, right? A lot of students who really aren't quite sure how to approach things. And so we assign pre-labs. And that kind of forces you, kind of whips you into getting at least started. 106, nah. We expect that you have read the lab, that you are coming in prepared that uh, basically in 106 labs, um, I'll meet you at the door. I'll say good evening. Um, I'll go over a very short presentation. And because I assume you have read the lab and understand it, then I'll say go. And I'll stand back and watch you go. Okay. So it's a lot more of the, of the you know, pressure is on you. It's not as much of a what I call a dog and pony show as 105 labs were, where there's a lot of orchestration. And it was all kind of keep on moving, whip you into this, do that, do that. 106, you'll come in and you'll, it's more freestyle. Okay, I'm there to help you. So, um, so there aren't pre-labs, very few that I can think of right now. And um, the, the pressure will be on you to have read it in advance and to, and to come in prepared. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So then there'll be lab quizzes. Too, there will be lab quizzes, absolutely. So uh, this week in lab, we're doing a histology review. In 105, you were responsible for, in the end, I think about 15 or 16 different tissue samples that you could recognize and know a little bit about. We'll be reviewing all of those 15 this week, plus adding two more to the pile. So it's not a whole lot of new material. It's truly a review. And next week, there'll be a quiz on histology. So all that lovely histology that you have forgotten or never learned, once again, will rise to the surface, and uh, you'll be reminded of all that good stuff. Yes, ma'am. Will I have my lab lectures on YouTube? I might, if you'd like me to. I'm only doing one. No, I'm doing, I'm doing a couple 106 labs. So yeah, I could possibly get that done. There really won't be very much to them. 
okay? They won't be as extensive as they were in 105. Any other thoughts? Good stuff. Are we ready? We excited? Looking forward to it? Just think, by the time we finish this semester, there will be tulips, <laughs> hopefully, poking up through the ground. And so that's always exciting. Uh, they do name this semester appropriately around here, because I swear winter is not over until the final exam is done. Right? It, it just doesn't seem to like spring until we get through with this stuff. OK, uh, if you will, turn into your lecture supplement if you were able to get one. If not, just kind of listen along. I think I provided this slide for you. For those who have not met me, or it's been a while, just a quick personal introduction about my crazy past. Um, this is my seventh year now at MCC. Hard for me to believe, well, actually, yeah, going on my seventh year at MCC. Um, hard for me to believe. I have a seven-year-old at home, and that's how I gauge my time here. He was born two weeks after we moved to Michigan. So I remember how long I've been here suffering through winter uh, when I look at his, at his birthday. Um, I received my undergraduate degree, my master's degree in microbiology, and then my PhD in medical sciences. And that was at the University of Florida uh, College of Medicine. And there I was pretty broadly trained in things like genetics and biochemistry, molecular biology, physiology. And uh, my wife, we met there at the university. She has her PhD in neuropsychology and speech pathology. And she's a clinical coordinator professor over at GVSU in the speech pathology program. So if any of you are thinking about speech pathology as a future possibility, you'll definitely be speaking with her at some point in the future. I usually send one or two students to her every year. Uh, so if you don't know much about speech, look into it. It's a good, good field. Um, our first positions, we went off to Washington State University. We were up in Spokane, Washington. Uh, I was in the Department of Genetics and Cell Biology. And then a few years after that, we, my wife was called down to the University of Alabama. And uh, we set up shop there for about six years. Every state we go to, we seem to pick up a child. Uh, so every time you see another state, just think, oh, there's another kid. Um, and then from Alabama, uh, we handed over to Oklahoma. And I was at Oklahoma Wesleyan for a few years. My wife was at the University of Tulsa. And then finally, we were back up here in Michigan. I shouldn't say back up here. never been here before. Um, Beth was called up to Calvin to help them start their master's program in speech pathology. And then after she got that program going for them, she hopped over to Grand Valley and helped them get their program going. And they've gone from one PhD to about eight right now, uh, with about 60 students graduating each year with their master's degree. So that program is just kind of blowing up and doing really, really well. Uh, we have five kids, and we're very, very busy, as you can imagine. I have a, a daughter who just finished the nursing program last semester here. Uh, she's continuing at BS, her BSN at Grand Valley. Uh, she has her first job at Helen DeVos, uh, Nick U. So she's excited about that job. And um, I have a daughter who's 19, who's at Grand Valley. She's pre-med, wants to be an anesthesiologist. I have a son who's 16. Uh, he's my big football player. He's uh, looking to play D1, D2 football. I've got a uh, 12-year-old, still trying to figure him out. And we've got a 7-year-old, first grader, who is, uh, his kind of claim to fame is uh, being the little brother of all the other crazy kids. And he's in a Chinese immersion program. So he's coming home speaking Mandarin every night. And we're trying to keep up with that. So we're a very, very busy household, okay, as you can imagine. So some of you have a lot of kids or a lot of busyness. Some of you are coming right out of high school and you think you're busy. You really don't understand what busy is. And, and some of the older folks in the room may just slap you if you, if you start talking about how busy your, your life is. Uh, so be really careful uh, what you say around some of the older, wiser students in the classroom about your busyness. But I understand busy. I live in Grand Rapids, so I'm commuting every day, so I understand all of those things that you, could, that you share with me, or I should say complain about, uh, in your own life. And my job is to help you be successful. So no matter what your path is, uh, nursing, respiratory therapy, pre-med, whatever it is you're thinking about, uh, please know I'm here to help you. My door is open, and I'd be glad to chat with you about some options and some ideas uh, as you move forward. OK, uh, we will be in this lab. I'm just going to put this up there. There will be some uh, technology used in the labs uh, that we'll be introducing you to. It's a program called iWorks. And this is the program that we'll be using to do EKGs and do respirometry studies and uh, some muscle physiology studies. And so just know that in the lab, um, I think I say that right now to let you know how important it is that you commit to your lab. It's a little bit different than 105. 
In 105, if you missed a lab and you went to a different lab, it was kind of the same experience, and you just learned it with a different group of people at the table. In 106 lab, and you'll hear this again this week, you're going to be in groups, and sometimes you're doing activities that go over a couple of weeks. And so when you're gone, they're missing you. And now you're showing up at a lab where you're the fifth wheel. And so it just, it, it's not as easy to move around in the 106 lab. So please, please, please try to make your attendance at your assigned lab a priority, not only for your sanity, but for your teammates' sanity, as we'll start depending upon you to be there to pull your weight during some of these projects. Okay, so just keep that in mind. It's a little bit different, and that's why I put that up there, just to remind you. And you do need a lab supplement. That's that red-covered uh, supplement, and that's all you really need for 106. If you're coming out of a recent 105 class, you're in pretty good shape. Okay, let's get started. Okay. I told you that we're going to be moving first into the nervous system. And the nervous system and, and how electrical impulses send, are sent down an axon, all of that information, to understand that, we got to turn to the back of the book. And in the back of the book, chapter 25, the first part of that chapter, there's like two parts to it, the first part talks about water balance, compartmentalization, compartmentals, compartmentals, compartments within your body, like extracellular versus intracellular fluid. We have to understand where sodium and potassium and calcium normally hang out in your fluids, because where sodium and potassium and calcium hang out is going to make a big impact on how nervous system, how the nervous system works, and then later on, how muscles work. You're going to be so tired of talking about sodium and potassium very, very soon, you're going to start throwing things at me. But we're going to start there. Okay? We're going to start talking about these things. So we all know the term homeostasis. Okay, what does homeostasis mean to you? All the mechanisms that control the normal function of the body. All the mechanisms that normally control the, bo the body's functions are, I'm paraphrasing, but that's exactly right. There's homeostasis, right, keeping things, quote, normal or within a normal range. When things no longer are in homeostasis, we call that disease, right, when we've lost our homeostatic control of something like blood pressure or something like that. Is homeostasis the same as equilibrium? In other words, are we always going to find the same amount of sodium on the inside of a cell as we do on the outside of the cell? Nope. Will there always be as much potassium inside the cell as outside the cell? No. So there's a difference between homeostasis, keeping things where they should be, and equilibrium, which would occur when sodium and potassium would be the same on both sides of a membrane, right? Inside the cell and outside the cell. We will never be at equilibrium until we're dead, right? Because our body is constantly fighting, working, spending energy, ATP, to keep things out of balance, right? It's in homeostatic balance, but it's not in chemical equilibrium. There aren't the same concentrations of molecules inside and outside the cells. So there's homeostatic balance of water, right? Pretty important stuff, actually. If water is, uh, there, if there's too much water in one part of your body, we call that edema, right? You're, you're, you've got some sort of swelling going on. It could be an indication of a number of things, lymphatic problems or even cardiovascular problems. There's going to be a homeostatic balance about electrolytes. Think sodium, potassium, calcium. We're going to talk about that a little bit right now. And then there's acid-base balance, and we're going to save that conversation till the end of the course. We'll come back and visit Chapter 25 again after or as we're discussing the kidneys, because the kidneys and the urinary system are getting rid of acids, metabolic acids from your body. And so we'll talk about acid balance later in the course. Now, you have all these systems that are actually working to maintain these balances. Pretty much, you see all of the systems out there, right? You've got the urinary, the respiratory system. Some of these are pretty obvious to us, right? Um, we're we're um, getting rid of fluid and electrolytes through the urinary system and acids. Respiratory system, um, we're blowing off CO2, right? And that, that can become a, an acid in our body if it's out of control. 
uh, digestive system, we're bringing in molecules and getting rid of waste products. In tegumentary system, we're sweating out stuff, but we're also bringing some stuff in through our skin. Uh, endocrine, right, we're definitely uh, secreting hormones, and those hormones are critical to the balance of this homeostasis. The nervous system, cardiovascular, lymphatic, there's not a whole lot of systems right up there that aren't involved <coughs> very much, very much involved with maintaining this homeostasis. So with that kind of background, let me jump into chapter 25 for you. And uh, each slide here or two is going to start off with a little learning outcomes, kind of like the objectives. What is it we're after? So as I go through this, make sure you can name the body's fluid compartments. Uh, you can summarize their contents, explain what's meant by fluid balance and how it's involved with homeostasis, and also know the mineral balance. Think electrolytes, think sodium, potassium, things like that. And then we'll continue on with uh, water and sodium as well. So let's just start off with body composition. There's inorganic and organic molecules. What's the difference? What's organic? Um, life forms. OK, organic molecules would be the macromolecules, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, right, and nucleic acids. Those are, your, those are your organic molecules. The inorganics are going to be water, minerals, right, calcium, magnesium, metals, things like that. Um, and we have water distributed throughout these fluid compartments in our body. You know that there are trillions of cells in your body. Each cell is surrounded by a plasma membrane. That plasma membrane is the barrier between what's inside and what's outside the cell. There are certain molecules that need to be inside in higher concentration. There are certain molecules that need to be outside the cell in certain concentrations. And there are going to be active transport mechanisms, blast from the past, active transport tells us that molecules are moving across the membrane but are dependent upon energy, ATP. What I need you to appreciate is that your body spends a lot of energy, ATP, keeping things in homeostatic static balance. In order to keep sodium in the right place at the right time, in order to keep potassium in the right place at the right time, there's a lot of energy needed to maintain that. Because if the cell is unable to maintain those sodium potassium levels in the proper place, your nervous system shuts down. Your muscles can't contract. Your wounds can't heal. So we've got to have sodium, potassium, and calcium in the right place at the right time, in the right concentrations, for your body to maintain its normal function. So what do we have? We've got the intracellular fluid, ICF, okay? Intra, within, within the cell. We might also call this the cytosol, the fluid within the cells, okay? And that percent's going to change. I'll show you a figure in a moment. Um, now keep in mind that physiology, <coughs> is based upon the science of physiology historically. It's changing. But historically, physiology was built on the back of a 25-year-old male who weighed 150 pounds. Okay? So what were considered normal physiological values from the historical data through you know, medical journals for the last few decades, they were always kind of referring back to this idealized 25-year-old male who weighs 150 pounds. Anybody know that person? OK, so in other words, there's variations, right? And there's variations um, you know, between men and women, fluid levels, electrolyte levels, and things like that. So there will be a little bit of difference between it. Partly, men have more muscle mass on average. Women have more fat content on average. That distribution of tissues also makes a difference in the water content overall in one's body. Then there is the extracellular fluid the stuff outside of the cells. Do you agree that this is also called interstitial fluid? The stuff outside of cells is interstitial fluid? And that, that would also include plasma, right? Do you agree that blood, plasma, is extracellular fluid? It's fluid outside of the red blood cells. It's fluid outside of the white blood cells. It's the stuff that those cells are floating in. Again, males have larger blood volumes. And so that's going to make a difference as well when we think about overall variations. Now, you're not going to memorize these numbers per se. I'll tell you what you need to know. And I know these are a little bit small. Uh, on, the, on the left, is, this is a male, okay? 
So this is the male over here, and this is the female. And really what you see, plasma is about the same. It's about 4.5%, so don't worry about that. What's the big thing you see in the difference here? At the very top here, it says water 60%, water 50%. So males have, on average, more water, right? Um, more muscle mass. Muscle doesn't have a lot of water in it, whereas fat is, a, is more of a, of a loose connective tissue. So there's more water within fat. Women have, by nature, more fat. Therefore, they have more, um, um, a displacement of the water. So women actually have a little bit less water overall. The organic solids, a little bit different. Again, you're not going to focus on this. So I just want you to appreciate that whereas in the old days, uh, you would just see numbers for that 25-year-old male, we do recognize that there are differences in the electrolyte and overall solids in males versus females. So what is this stuff? The solid components of your body. It's going to account for somewhere between 40 and 50% of your body mass. It's going to include both your organic and your inorganic molecules. So it's going to include those organic molecules, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, minerals, as well as, um, uh, sorry, as well as nucleic acids and the minerals. And remember, the minerals are going to be, looks like we're still going. The minerals are going to be the inorganic molecules like the electrolytes. Okay, so that's all the solid component. So here's a little slide, just an overall idea. Uh, this is looking at um, the solid components within an average individual. So we're looking at proteins. That's by far the largest group, isn't it? Okay, proteins, the largest group. Then a fair amount of lipids, fats, minerals. Uh, carbohydrates don't get stored very much in our body. Right? There's a little bit of storage of sugars in our liver, but for the most part, sugars get in, they get utilized, they get used up for energy. So there's not a lot of storage of sugars in our body, whereas proteins get stored you know, as muscle and other things. And then everything else, just the garbage can. So everything else is uh, adding up. So this is going to be kilograms of protein. And again, this is going to be, these numbers are going to be for that idealized individual. So... What I want you to think about is simply that we've got these different compartments, and I'm going to go through some of those names of those compartments here in a moment. Water. Does water how does water get across the membrane, the cell membrane? I heard osmosis. Right? That's the movement of water across the membrane. We know that. Uh, osmosis is really, really fast. Um, what, dr what drives the movement of water? Is osmosis active or passive? Passive. Passive. It's a form of diffusion, right? Remember, diffusion is a passive process, no energy. What's our phrase from lab two at 105? Solutes yeah. suck. What are those solutes? Sodium. Sodium, potassium, proteins, sugars, right? So what's going to drive the movement of water from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane? Think of that red blood cell we did in lab, right? It, it could it could shrink or it could explode and take on some fluid and maybe even burst. That hypo and hypertonic story that we talked about a little bit last semester. So we know that water moves and it's drawn largely by solutes. So again, that idea of sodium, potassium, calcium, proteins, sugars, all that's going to be directing where water is going to move. So there's this constant balancing act of water gains and water losses. We drink water, we get rid of water. Um, that's how we get most of our water, right? We drink it. But where else do we get water, folks? Where do we get water? Water is gained through, colon, our diet, absorption, right? Through, from our diet, from the foods and the drinks that we consume. Water is taken into our digestive system, into our body. That water is, is used, very important. That's the primary way. But then it says metabolic processes. What is that referring to? Respiration. respiration. Perfect. What is respiration? Breathing. breathing. That's true. Respiration is breathing on a sort of macroscopic stage, right? We breathe. That's respiration. But from a physiological standpoint, another way of thinking about respiration is cellular respiration. 
And that's something that I honestly don't spend a lot of time on in my courses because most of you have or will take microbiology. Okay, is that true? Most of you have or will take, have or will, right? And in that environment or in other biology courses, you will get your fill of cellular respiration. But what is the basic idea of cellular respiration? Where is this other water coming from? Somebody give me the equation if you remember it. We won't even do the C6H1206, right? Glucose, right? Plus what? What are we all doing? We're all taking in sugar. Oxygen. We better all be breathing, right? And what else do we all do? Sometimes you'll see water here, right? Because we're taking in water. Sometimes the water's not there. What happens with this stuff? Glucose, oxygen, and water. Through the processes of cellular respiration and what our cells are so good at doing, what happens? It's catabolized. At the end, what comes out at the end of this big reaction? CO2. CO2. We're going to blow that off, most of it, in our respiration system, right? Respiratory system. And water. Okay? So this is the water that we kind of take into our body. But look what's happening. We're actually making water. That's what we call metabolic water. Now, what else do we get out of this? We get energy, right? We get ATP, E, energy. So that's what's going on. Every one of your cells is taking in sugar and oxygen, going through a very complex set of uh, processes and steps, and from it making CO2, carbon dioxide, and water. You're actually producing water in your body. The water that you drink in is not necessarily the water that you urinate. It's given rearranged and moved around through different chemical processes. Okay? And it's from this that we also get our energy. So think about it. We've got water through our diet, but we also have water coming in from this process. And every one of your cells in your body depends upon this process of cellular respiration in order to get the energy that it needs to do its processes. And along the way, we make this CO2 and this water. The CO2 we'll deal with when we get to the respiratory system. All right, how do we get rid of that CO2? If that CO2 accumulates in our bodies, we're going to be dead pretty soon. We've got to get rid of that CO2, and we have to get rid of the water. So we've got the urinary system and the respiratory system working along with the cardiovascular system, and by the end of the course, you'll better understand how these systems work together to maintain homeostasis of everything in your body, but especially of water, CO2. How do we lose water? Because we've got water coming in, what we drink, what we eat, and what we create through metabolic processes. And now we're also going to get rid of that water. Pretty st straightforward. We're going to urinate, right? And we're also going to, uh, through our feces, feces are, are not that aqueous, right? Most of the water has been extracted from our feces, but there's some, right? There's some water being lost through defecation. And there's also a fair amount of water being lost through sweat, evaporation, transpiration across our, our skin. And every time you blow off, right, you, you, you know that you're blowing off moisture, if you will, so you're losing water that way as well. So we have this balance, in and out, in and out. And water is moving by osmosis throughout our body from cell to cell based upon the, the, the needs of the cells. And as I said, solutes suck, so water is being drawn into and out of cells based upon other electrolyte concentrations. Not to memorize the numbers, OK? But I want you just to see something here. Water in equals water out. This is, again, that idealized <coughs> average person. If you're, if you're a person who exercises a lot and you're drinking a lot of water, you may find that these numbers don't really you know, equal your input and output. Or maybe you don't drink this much or urinate this much. Again, these are kind of ide idealized numbers. But what you see is that what goes in is what goes out. Right, on average, every day, in and out, balanced. Okay? So that kind of breaks down what we're getting. So if you got about 1,000 milliliters, a liter, of water from your food and another liter from your liquid or so consumption, about 300 milliliters is going to come from catabolism. Who recalls what catabol means? It's breaking down. Catabolism is breaking down. What was building up? Anabolism. Anabolic, right? So catabolism simply means that as your cells are doing that cellular respiration thing, we're creating water. That's that 300 milliliters here. And then urination, evaporation, lungs, feces, pretty much a balancing act, isn't it? Okay. 
Uh, and we, we appreciate this. Uh, now, look at this. We're talking about you're drinking in about 2,200 mils. Go back and look at the numbers. Okay, 2,200 mils between your food and your water. And, oh, okay, so that's what's coming in, right? But there's a lot more going on. At the end, right, we're going to, in the end, lose through the feces. But we're also going to look at how much fluid is being reabsorbed and absorbed and secreted the, the saliva. You're making 1,500 mils of saliva every day. Right? Your body needs that water. It, there's also gastric secretions. The liver is making bile. That's liquid. There's pancreatic juices. There's all sorts of things that this water is being used for internally that we kind of lose track of. So don't just think 2,500 mils in, 2,500 mils out, but that water is being used in many, many different ways to maintain our homeostasis. Now, the real punchline, the real take-home lesson today is making sure we understand the ICF versus the ECF. That's my big take-home lesson for the day. The intracellular versus the extracellular fluid and what is found there. We have different compartments in our body. You know, we have tears, we have saliva, we've got inside of our cells, outside of our cells, we have plasma of the blood, and the contents are a little bit different. Now, remember that the composition is different. In other words, sodium and potassium are different and that would create an osmotic equilibrium. In other words, water is where it needs to be based upon those gradients, those differences in the electrolytes. Water moves really, really fast. Okay, just boom, it, it moves. It moves across the membrane. If you remember when we did the blood cells, uh, we didn't even have time to blink, if you will. If you add water to a red blood cell, it just kind of, that hypo, hyperosmotic thing, it is fast. So water's moving across the membrane very, very quickly. The ions don't move quite as quickly, okay? And so some of these uh, molecules take a lot longer to reach equilibrium. Take a look at this slide, idealized. Again, we've got the membrane. This is representing a cell on the left-hand side. The orange is the plasma membrane. We recognize a few cartoons of mitochondria, a little bit of Golgi, some endoplasmic reticulum, the nucleus, things that you remember about cells. And this is the fluid, extracellular fluid on the outside. And we talked about how water's coming in and there's water being lost in and out from this. And then we lose water through urine as well. But there's this movement of water because where does the metabolic water come from? Inside the cells, doesn't it? The cells themselves are producing that metabolic water. So think about that. The metabolic water is being produced by the cells and being added to the fluid of the body. Now, when can this go wrong? Okay, dehydration. If you're dehydrated, uh, you're going to have a loss of water. The, the incoming water is going to be, you know, uh, out, outpaced by the, or the, sorry, the loss of water will be outpaced, I'm saying it backwards, water loss is outpaced the water gains. That's the way I want to say it. And so what happens if you're losing water? If you're losing water from your body, what's going to happen to the osmotic concentration, the amount of water? Water loss from the extracellular fluid, right? Read this with me. Water is going to be lost from the extracellular fluid. This is going to increase the osmotic concentration. This means that the electrolytes are going to be in higher concentration. You're also going to start moving fluid from inside the cells to help accommodate this. And if this, continue, if this continues, then there'll be such a loss of water from your body that you will start getting severe thirst. Right? You'll be dryness of your tissues. There'll be wrinkling of your skin. And if you continue to lose water, it would start to interfere with your blood volumes and your plasma levels and your ability to maintain your cardiovascular health. So this can lead to a drop in blood pressure, and a drop in blood pressure is, a, is a, one of the types of shock. So dehydration can be very, very serious, especially for little kids because they don't have much volume in the first place to adjust, and for the elderly. Okay, so the elderly and the young are more susceptible to dehydration issues. So if we take a look at the top picture, this represents intracellular and extracellular fluid. Now here they're in balance. They're not 50-50, right? You see that there's more water inside the cells than there is outside the cells, but that's what normal is, right? That's how the body maintains the homeostasis. And so we would call that isotonic, they're balanced. And so if you lose fluid, you're gonna start having extracellular fluids coming down. As this drops, 
that's going to start decreasing your intracellular fluid, and the, uh, the, the uh, cascade would continue until there was a reestablishment of the balance, but you could have some damage along the way. So this is just the same slides again. So just again, how do we get fluid in? And how do we get fluid out? Think about that. And as you are losing fluid, uh, the electrolytes are being shifted around a little bit, the water is being shifted around a little bit, and that can help us understand dehydration. But what happens when you become dehydrated? What, what, hap what do you do? What does your body do when you're, when you're dehydrated? Yeah, taking water from other organs, and you become conscious that you're thirsty, don't you? Okay, so there are what's called osmoreceptors, and I've got this coming up in a moment. But there are osmoreceptors, and these osmoreceptors are receptors that are measuring your water levels, basically, within your blood. And when they start to drop, those osmoreceptors tell your brain that you're thirsty, and now you go get a drink. You may have heard it said, if you are thirsty, you're already dehydrated. Have you heard that said before? That you should kind of just keep pushing water and drinking routinely. And if, if you are thirsty, you're already dehydrated. That's absolutely right. If you're thirsty, it's because your hypothalamus, a part of the brain that has these osmoreceptors, has already detected that your body is deficient in fluid and has, has noticed that problem and has sent the signal to your consciousness telling you to go drink. I see you drinking, right? So, you know, the, the moment we sense thirst, our body is already telling us, hey, dummy, you should have already had something to drink. Your body's already kicking into overdrive, telling you to drink. Again, there's a balance between absorption of water and minerals as well and the excretion. Your kidneys are getting rid of sodium and potassium. We have to keep that balancing act as well. So your body's going to keep key reserves. It's going to make sure your calcium, potassium, and sodium levels are in the right place. We need to have a certain amount of these molecules coming into our body, right? If we um, lose too many of these minerals, we can also be out of whack. So where do we hold on to these things? Okay. So you're going to be absorbing some ions, some sodium, potassium, calcium. Those molecules are going to be absorbed by your intestines. Remember, though, that your bones are also storing a lot of calcium and phosphorus, and they're going to release it as needed. And they're going to have a balancing act between what's being stored in the bones and what's available to your body, to your cells. And then uh, as those molecules become available, you're going to be sweating some of them out, and you're going to be releasing some of them through the kidneys. So again, water is going through your body and being removed and, and added to, and these minerals also are in a balancing act. You need a certain amount added, you're going to lose a certain amount through your kidneys, and this is highly, highly regulated. Not to memorize the list, but take a look. Most of these minerals, what you're going to see is active, active, active transport. Some sort of energy is necessary to keep your sodium, potassium. Look at these, just so you don't know them all. Uh, sodium, calcium, potassium, magnesium, iron, chlorine, iodine, bicarbonate, nitrates, phosphates. These are all molecules that are on your vitamins, right? They're the things that you're taking in in small amounts. We take them in in our food as well. But there's a very uh, energy-needed mechanism to keep these in the right level. This is also true of, of other molecules. Where are you losing these things? And all these figures are coming from your textbook. But where are you losing sodium? Where are you losing potassium? It gives us the major routes of excretion. How much our body normally has? These numbers are just for reference, not to memorize. And how much we should have in our daily diet to help maintain these levels. We certainly don't have any problem in this country keeping our sodium levels up, right? We have plenty of sodium everywhere in our diet. Um, we're pretty much out of time. And I didn't quite get to the end of this, but I will finish up the last little bit on this on um, Thursday. Please, action, point of action number one. Get on the blackboard, get into mastering, get that figured out. If you have any questions about resources, let me know. I don't want us to go into this long. We have a long weekend coming up, right? We haven't earned it, but we have a long weekend coming up. I want to make sure all housekeeping technology issues are solved by Thursday before we go away for a long weekend so that you're not starting next week still wondering how to get started. So please go ahead and, and get that taken care of.